Hey guys, Cade Wilcox here, host of the Primitive Podcast. On this week's episode, we have Dusty Womble. Dusty Womble is a Lubbock businessman, uh, started a really cool software company in the 1980s, eventually sold it to Tyler Technologies, which is a publicly traded company. Many of you may have heard of Tyler Technologies before, but maybe don't exactly know uh, what they do. And so you'll learn that in this episode. Probably my favorite part of the episode is when Dusty uh, goes into uh, just some things he's learned from getting to know Chris Beard, the, the head men's basketball coach of Technologies. Texas Tech, and uh, just everything he's learned by being around him. It was a, a really fascinating conversation, and I really enjoyed it, and uh, I'm, I'm certain you will too. So thanks, as always, for listening. Um, share with your friends, invite people to listen, and if you don't mind, please uh, subscribe for us, uh, which really helps the podcast pick up some traction. So thanks for listening, and I uh, hope you enjoy. Well, Dusty, thanks uh, for jo- joining us. I know you're extremely busy. You have a lot of irons in the fire, and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to connect and be on our podcast. And so why don't we start out by uh, you just kind of sharing with our audience a bit about your background, where you're from, um, a little bit about your, your business background, and maybe some of the things you're involved in now. Like, uh, you know, I know you're a region at Tech and involved in a lot of really great things. So let's, uh, let's start out there. Well, I appreciate you having me on, Kate. Uh, I grew up in Amarillo, uh, came to school here at Tech in uh, 1977, graduated uh, four years later uh, with a degree in MIS uh, through the School of Business here. I uh, actually started my business uh, before I got out of school, so I started it in the summer before my senior year. Uh, it was called ENCODE, stood for Interactive Computer Designs. Uh, this was right around the time that um, this was actually before PCs uh, came into effect. So these were mini computers uh, that we were working on at that point in time, IBM system uh, 34s and, and uh, other brands of equipment. And started a little computer software company uh, building custom software. Um, as I said, I graduated in 81 uh, and continued to grow the business. It was sort of a lifestyle business uh, for several years in the, in, the, in the early 80s. Had a handful of employees, but usually had less than 10 employees. Uh, in the, the late 80s, um, a gentleman by the name of Steve Neiman uh, came and joined the company, uh, and we decided to really try to build it into a bigger organization. So between the late 80s and uh, the late 90s, we grew it into a regional firm. We were doing probably uh, $5 million a year in annual uh, soft and annual revenue. Uh, and we had maybe 65 employees or something like that in the, in the late 90s. Uh, we were approached by a, t- a public company called Tyler Technologies uh, in late 97 and in 1998, uh, we merged our company with uh, two other companies to really form Tyler Technologies. Tyler had been a longtime company. We've been Tyler's been on the New York Stock Exchange for uh, about sixty years now. So it's oh, wow. been a long time. Uh, we just uh, but but in night in the late nineties they had really shrunk themselves down. Our market cap at one point in time in two thousand uh, was probably around 150 million. Uh, so we got to be a pretty small company to be a publicly traded company. Uh, and so we got involved in 98 uh, and Y2K happened in 2000. It was uh, the, the uh, internet bubble burst in, in uh, late 2000. And, and it was a pretty, uh, pretty ugly period of time for Tyler and, and those of us that had hitched our wagon to Tyler. And uh, so our sort of probably should backtrack a little bit uh, and talk through a little bit about what our company does. So ENCODE, we ended up uh, really specializing and focusing on local government software. So we did really everything at City Hall from municipal court, uh, all the fund accounting, payroll, uh, accounts payable, with a big focus in utility billing. And, and uh, we specialized really in cities under... 100,000 in population. Uh, and we had a, a pretty big regional concentration and, 
And after becoming part of Tyler, we continued to focus on that. We added other components like uh, uh, public safety and, and jail and, and uh, other things uh, to our offering. And uh, so I said, as I said, in the early 2000, the company uh, really got pretty small. Our, our stock traded down to as low as a dollar for a period of time. Golly, was that scary? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really was uh, because, uh, you know, th this was a company that I, you know, spent my life building and, and being a part of uh, the people that were here, you know, working with me. Uh, they really saw it as a career. And I was really wondering, I'd, I'd sort of lost a little bit of control during those uh, during those periods. Um, I ran my operation. Tyler had done about 30 acquisitions between 97 and 2000, early 2000. And a lot of those companies had come under my control, uh, but uh, you know it was a. I, I, at that time, I wasn't really involved at the corporate level at Tyler, mm. uh, but we survived that. We made some maneuvers. Um, I think in 2005, I got promoted to executive vice president at Tyler and really ran about half the company, uh, and. Uh, we started to really focus on not just acquiring companies, but really consolidating them, running a real business and, and really um, building a, the best business we could. And uh, so between 2005 and, and uh, 2016, um, I had uh, more of a corporate role at Tyler. Uh, I went on the board of directors, I think in 2005, might've been 2006. And, and uh, assume more of a, a corporate role and less of a role here in this in the Lubbock office. Uh, we grew the business over those years into a pretty successful business. Our market cap, well, until until a month ago, our our market cap was probably around fourteen billion. So uh, we sort of weathered the storm. I think uh, I think actually today I don't know where it is today, but I think we're actually trading above our stock prices. Probably a little yesterday I think it closed a little over three hundred dollars. Uh, I think at the beginning of the year it was right at 300. So I actually think we're up here to date. Yeah, kind of hanging tight. Yeah, it's been great. So uh, I, we've had some big fluctuations in in the first in the first quarter. Our stock traded probably up to close to 340. Uh, and then uh, with all of the uh, coronavirus issues and uh, the shutdown of the economy, it's traded down probably all the way to 260. And then we sort of recovered back into the into the low 300s. Yeah, that's good. I just have a few questions about kind of your journey from, you know, a startup to, you know, kind of a, a lifestyle business to a publicly traded company. Was there like, did you, did you at some moment in your journey decide like, Hey, this is what we want to do. Or was it more of just an opportunity that presented itself? Like how, how that really, you know, happened that a couple of guys in Lubbock, Texas, you know, next thing you know, you're kind of, you know, now you're a part of a publicly traded company. Was that an intentional decision or did you just kind of find yourself in the in the middle of an opportunity? No, I think we just, we always just tried to do, build the best company we could. We, we were not focused on getting bigger. We wanted to get better. Um, and so we acquired a lot of the people that I hired 30 years ago are still with the company. Wow. So we really never had debt on the company. We grew it out of uh, our earnings. Uh, we we tried to just get better every year. And the, and the industry that we were in, local government, is not a fast moving industry. So our sales cycles are real real long. I mean, sometimes we'll work with a customer two or three years before we get a uh, we get a deal from them. Uh, and, and but the good thing about that, once you have those customers and you do a good job, that relationship lasts for years and years. And uh, so we've been fortunate that we were in a good market segment. We outlasted a lot of our competitors uh, over the years. And uh, though, so it's been a, it's it's not been something that we tried to build as big a company as we could or build a company that we could sell to somebody else. Uh, we just tried to be opportunistic, try to make it. Uh, you know, try to make the company better every year. Right. And to try to really, our biggest key is we've hired really good people. And if you hire enough really good people, you're going to have a really good company. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, that's probably where we've been most successful. Did you start out uh, focused as a niche with, you know, municipalities or, or did you kind of find that niche, you know, you know, several years into building the business? Because that, that's yeah. a lot, something businesses I think struggle with a lot is, 
is the fear of niching is like, you know, it's a little scary versus trying to be everything to all people. So what'd that journey look like? Yeah, I think uh, it was always a mission of mine to try to find something that we could leverage. And so to leverage, if you're in a, if you're in a business where every month you start at zero and you have to go sell customers, do service, deliver product, and, and you don't get the leverage over your past history, it's a very difficult business and it's very difficult to build that uh, into something that you can grow year over year over year over year. And so we were always looking for, or I was always looking for a niche. Uh, local government just happened to be something we fell into uh, just because we did a couple of deals for some, uh, we did a deal for the city of Littlefield and, and some other regional uh, cities in, in the region. And we really realized, hey, there's a void here. And we, if we build a really good product, we can sell this over and over and over again. And, and so that was really how we found that. We looked at, we looked at other opportunities uh, that we, you know, were experimenting or that we had done custom software for and said, hey, can we really turn this into a business? And local government just happened to be something that we sort of settled on, but it wasn't something we picked out and uh, intentionally, but we were all, I was always looking for something that we could leverage. And the fact that we had 120 customers makes it easier to grow to 140 and uh, the 140 makes it easier to grow to 200. Right. We were looking for that. Yeah, that's good. What, uh, what, what else are you involved in? It's a, it's a, an incredible journey with Tyler and encode and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's really, uh, I think for our listeners who aren't business owners, it's really hard to to run and grow a business and, and to sustain success. And so, um, you know, congrats on that. And it, it's a, it's clear that you've been able to do that. What, uh, you know, your whole experience with Tyler has created a whole whole host of other opportunities for you. What are some of the other uh, exciting things that you spend your time doing and that you're really passionate about? I don't know how exciting they are, but... <laughs> Uh, I retired from Tyler in 2016. I still serve on the board of directors. That that doesn't require a lot of uh, my time, uh, but I still have a pretty active, or I, I have what I consider to be an important role uh, at Tyler uh, from the board of directors, just because I have a lot of history. I know the components that are at Tyler. I understand the landscape. I have confidence in our management team. I have a lot of direct communication with our management team and and uh, so we, we talk a lot uh, and, and I really enjoy my time still at Tyler. I love being associated with the people at Tyler. They're great people, it's a great company. Uh, but I've gotten involved in um, a variety of other uh, opportunities, some of which are just almost at the investment level. I'm involved in a company here that uh, David Bateman runs uh, called Amplisign. Uh, it was called Amplisign now, now it's called SitePro. Uh, that really uh, manages wastewater disposal uh, from a whole variety of uh, aspects in the oil and gas business. Uh, and I have very little active role there uh, other than just an investment, but it's a, it's a really interesting company. It's much, it grows much faster than, uh, than what any of the companies I was ever uh, running. Uh, they, they really have an, an appetite for growing that business in a, in a hurry and, and uh, so we've done that in a lot of different ways than what Encode and Tyler has grown over the years. Um, I got involved with Rhett Newberry in a group at a, at a company that were called The Pros uh, a few years, probably five years ago. Uh, I made an investment there and became uh, chairman of the board. So I've got a pretty active role uh, in that investment. Uh, when we originally got involved, it was a machine shop uh, doing about two and a half million dollars a year. And, in, uh, in, in revenue, and, and we've really grown that. Uh, and we've really morphed it now into a business that really sells uh, compression rental, or not sells, rents, uh, compression uh, equipment uh, in the oil and gas business uh, all over Oklahoma and, and now into, into the Permian. And uh, it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really good business. I've got several people in town that are investors in that business. And and other, it's in a really good segment of a really crappy. In, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm not uh, for sure how you're sleeping a lot right now with all the fluctuations and all the things that yeah. you're involved in. You got old and gap. <laughs> yeah, uh, 
with, and we, we've changed the name of that company to Metalinum and, uh, and, but we really deliver a, a um, almost like a production utility. They have to have these compression, these compressors on site to produce the oil uh, in those wells. And so we're really providing the power to get the oil out of the, out of the ground. Uh, and so unless they start to shut those wells down, uh, they're going to need compression. Now, if the industry, when the industry is under pressure, that flows downhill. We feel that pressure. People put pressure on us on accounts receivable, uh, price competition. They want to write us for concessions um, and, and other things. So it does, it's not like we're immune. As I said, it's a crappy industry segment right now, but we're in a pretty good section of a crappy industry segment. Yeah, that's positive. And so that's a that's an interesting business. I, I, I think it's really unique because my whole business career up until a few years ago was really dealing with intellectual properties. When I originally got involved with Metal Linum, it was a machine shop. And so it was a very blue collar uh, place to go. I mean, you saw guys with welders and, and lathes and all kinds of really hard uh, asset equipment. And it was a really different uh, environment for me to be involved with, but it's been a really good experience. We've grown that business quite a bit. What initially intrigued you about you know be, you know going from kind of a business operator to an investor in businesses? Because you know those are a handful of businesses you're involved in, but you you got you know on some level of involvement, you're involved with a lot of different businesses. And I'm curious to you know what what intrigued you about kind of going that direction, um, and then you know what what maybe is different about about that role versus being really a leader and an operator of a single business. So what are some of the things you've learned there and, and what made you kind of want to get involved with so many different businesses? Well, uh, that's a good question. I, uh, I probably got involved with maybe too many businesses when I first retired. I'd always heard, man, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to let you, you don't want to get too, uh, you don't want to get too uninvolved because you, you lose your edge. And so I might've gone a little bit overboard and got involved in, and uh, other maybe too many investments at at, at one point in time, um, but I, I also had uh, the desire. I have I have a big exposure still to the stock market through my uh, Tyler uh, interest, and and so I wanted to not just take that money out of one stock, which was a really good stock in Tyler, and, and then diversify it across the market. Uh, I wanted to really try to be invested in some other opportunities that were not so stock market related. So uh, we've got a couple of partnerships that have got quite a bit of real estate in town. Most of it uh, is not uh, is commercial real estate, whether they're office buildings or strip malls. Uh, we have some land plays uh, in that as well. Um, and then the other, you know, I, I wanted to stay involved in business. Uh, Rhett Newberry that runs uh, Metalinum. Uh, he's, he's a great guy. I really like being around him. He brings the right kinds of questions to it, so, to me. So I don't get involved in day-to-day -day stuff. It's all strategic level um, decisions that, that I'm involved in. And uh, it's a great relationship between Red and I. I'm um, involved in uh, a buy here, pay here a lot, Charisma. Uh, I'm a partner in Racer, uh, Classic Car Wash. Uh, we've got like five partners in that. Uh, and I don't have a lot of day-to-day -day responsibilities in either one of those uh, two businesses, and uh, so it, it was—it's been interesting. I mean, I've learned—I've learned a lot. I've—I've I've, uh, uh, I've learned some. I've, to some extent, I learned how great we had it at Tyler. Uh, at you know, when you build when you're involved in a company that has really good leverage, real repeatable revenues. Uh, you've really been able to be the premier provider in your market segment, uh, and so you can you can control your your pricing advantage. Uh, you have a lot of leverage. Uh, you have really great margins, and you can attract really good people to a long term career uh, in a stable market. Because when you're dealing with public sector, uh, as I said, they're really slow moving, but they're slow moving on the upside and they're slow moving on the downside. Yeah, that makes sense. Our applications are mission critical. So we're not delivering park and recs applications that they can say, okay, we're just going to get rid of that for the next two years. Uh, we're delivering payroll, public safety, uh, 
tax accounting, we're automating court systems. They don't really have an option not to do those things. Right. So it's, it was, you know, as anything, as much as anything, I've learned how great we had it at Tyler. That's good. What, uh, how would you view your approach to leadership now? Like, again, certainly there's, there's a major difference in the eighties and nineties when you were really in ramp up mode of leading a single company. But right now, like where you're at, you know, you're, you're heavily involved at Texas tech, you're heavily involved with Texas tech men's basketball. You're heavily involved in, 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 uh, your investment companies, even, even though it's obviously at different levels. So how would you view your role, uh, as a leader now compared to maybe, you know, again, what it was like when you were, you know, really leading a single company. How do you view that? Yeah, well, my uh, my roles are are very different. Uh, when I was at Tyler for most of my career, I had direct day to day responsibilities. So a lot of personnel, you know, as you know, running a business, half of your business is dealing with personnel, and the other half is dealing with customers, and you know, the other half is dealing with really growing the business and making uh, financial decisions or product decisions, marketing decisions, right. and all of those things. And so uh, now, fortunately, or you know, fortunately for me, I don't have a lot of <laughs> uh, the day-to-day personnel kinds of decisions. Somebody's between me and, and those kinds right. of uh, You know, we have been involved over the last few weeks about Hey, what are we going to do with our staff? Or you know, how are we going to man? You know, how are we going to navigate through this? And so, to some extent, I've been involved in some of those personnel decisions, not specific personnel, but right. we've decisions that we're not going to trim staff, and and we're going to continue to compensate them even if they can't work right now. We've been talking about how do we how do we enable them to be effective or as effective as they can be remotely, uh, and you know, make sure we provide all those benefits and. and things like that. So, um, you know, I'm, and and as as my leadership role probably now is to some extent a calming force. So, uh, I've been through, nobody's been through what the country's going through right now, but you know, I was here during 2008 and the financial crisis and the meltdown. Uh, I was in it world, uh, Y2K when the internet bubble, burst right uh, I've, I've seen the late 80s when interest rates were 12 and a half percent and people were trying to to buy homes you know I've, I've been through times when we had the oil embargo and you couldn't uh, you know you couldn't get gas uh, 9/11 all those sorts of things so to some extent I think my role is to look at a big picture and say we faced big challenges in the past. Uh, we'll get by this. The world will be different. Uh, we'll, it'll be our responsibility to figure out what's different about it and how do we find our way there? How do we find an advantage and how do we position ourselves uh, in the new world order? Uh, but I think to some extent, it's a, it's a calming force and, and uh, make sure everybody, you know, more of a reassuring voice that uh, this too shall pass. You know, I think that's really good. And I I think they're all really lucky, you know, to have you. It's probably been the hardest part for me leading all of our stuff through this is like, you know, I've not known anything but really good, you know, in terms of the economy and people are buying and spending money and things are humming along and everyone's encouraged. And so this is really the first experience. What what uh what are some of the things you think I mean I I was gonna ask you like how you treat failure. But maybe just given the current current circumstances that pretty much everybody finds themselves in, what are some things that you think are really critical when you're making decisions in the middle of a crisis or, or a downturn or a really difficult season? What are some things that you think are really important to, to consider as you're forced to make really fast decisions, but you still want to make good decisions? Like you, you, you mentioned all your experience going through those other experiences and downturns. What are some things you learned from that that you feel like you're able to leverage now in terms of wisdom and, and kind of thoughtfulness as you as you navigate tough decisions in this crisis? Well, again, I think uh, to some extent, you have to have a long-term view and, and know that uh, while things are tough right now, uh, there will be bright days on the other side. Even though the world may be different on the other side, we're going to be in prosperous times again. Right. Uh, so I think you need to, especially in the leadership position, 
you need to be able to convey a sense of comfort and optimism on where we're at. You do have to be able to be willing to make tough decisions. I mean, uh, you have to make decisions, whether those are personnel decisions, whether those are strategic decisions. Uh, and, and, and a lot of these decisions are not right or wrong. I mean, we may find, if you don't really know uh, whether the right, what the right decision is, uh, whether you're talking about a career change, uh, a product direction, uh, a personnel matter, who you promote, who you, who you, you know, who you let go, uh, what kind of teams you put together, all those kinds of decisions. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer in most times. So uh, Coach Beard uses a saying, you make a decision and then you make it right. Uh, I think that's a really good way to put that is that uh, you do, you make the best decision you can and then you make sure that whatever you do from that point forward makes that the right decision. And, uh, and so you, uh, as a leader, you have to have confidence because people are going to question your decisions. You have to be willing to listen to their opinion and you have to be willing to, uh, not be so rigid on your decision that you're not willing to backtrack. You have to be willing to say that was a mistake. We went a wrong direction and I'm not going to try to prove that decision was right by plowing it by plowing forward. I'm willing to reevaluate that decision and go in another direction. But for the most part, when you make decisions that there are no right or wrong answers on, you don't look back. You make that decision, and then you do whatever you need to do to make that the, the right decision. That's really good. Yeah, really good advice. Well, you, you're surrounded, uh, you know, by a lot of really great leaders. I mean, you're a regent, so you're around uh, Ted Mitchell. You're, you're, you know, you're highly supportive of the men's basketball, so you're around Chris Beard. You mentioned him. What are maybe one or two things that you've learned from either them or others that you think are, are some of the more kind of illuminating leadership characteristics and traits that you've learned over the last few years, getting to, to really be uh, involved and around those very high, high level, high quality leaders? I think uh, one of the interesting thing, one of the interesting things I've learned from Dr. Mitchell um, is that I'm convinced he would have been successful anywhere we, he would have been. I think we could put him uh, in charge of the law school and he knows nothing about the law, but he understands how to manage people. He understands how to listen to and evaluate problems. He understands process. He understands team building. He's articulate. He's personable. He, uh, people like him. Uh, he's, a, he's a charismatic figure to some extent. And, uh, and I think that it's proven to me that if you find really good people, they can be successful in any role you put them in. Uh, and, and so he's a great chancellor. He was great at the Health Science Center, even though I wasn't really uh, involved at the administration level when he served in that capacity. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that you could put Dr. Mitchell as governor of the state of New York and you would think he's the greatest governor that that state has ever had in a matter of months because he's just good. I mean, he, he's a good leader and a good leader doesn't always have to have a lot of subject matter expertise. If they're good at being a leader, that translates across industries. That's powerful. Uh, you know, I think one of the things I've learned from being around uh, Dr. Mitchell, uh, Dr. Or Dr. Beard, uh, Chris Beard, also very educational. He'd probably tell you he's a doctor. Uh, that's been really uh, a really good experience for me. I would be a much better uh, leader of a company or builder of a company after being around Chris uh, for a few years uh, in that his work ethic is second to none. He's very driven. Uh, he has a huge fear of failure. Uh, and he instills that really in his players. I mean, you know, he really almost pushes back on the, the term fearless champions because he believes fear is a huge motivator. Uh, he wants his players uh, to be very worried and concerned about playing, you know, Bethane Cookman. He wants them to realize they can lose and what's on the line uh, if they don't show up and be ready to play uh, every night. Uh, he wants them to be concerned about uh, every practice. And if they don't get better at this particular practice they're about to have, 
somebody in the country is getting better and they're getting past. And, and uh, so he has a, he has a fear of failure, which I, I found that to be really interesting and, and a really good motivation for him uh, and, and his teams. Um, he is so process oriented. Uh, and, and because of that, he's very, his teams are going to be very predictable. Uh, obviously players matter and he certainly rep- recognizes that. Uh, but his, the process that he has, uh, is a machine, uh, because of his process, uh, he can take players and turn them, turn them into more than they thought that they could be if they're willing to do the work, uh, and that appeals to a lot of a lot of players. They have to be willing to put team first. They have to be willing to buy into what he's uh, what he preaches, and that is uh, not just basketball. That is, you take care of your body. You, you sleep right. You uh, you treat others around you right. You be a good teammate. You put in your work uh, plus some. Uh, that you you care about your classwork. You care about uh, all of the things around basketball. And if you love basketball and you want to be as good as you can be, it's a great program to be in. If you don't, you will not, you will, it will not be a good experience. Talent alone will not get you uh, where you want to get to inside of, in, inside of his program. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, 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 you know, who knows when, when things come back to normal and who knows what the new normal is, but I think I think they're going to be a really dangerous team next year. Um, I mean, they're, they 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 yeah they were trying to figure it out this year, but they they are going to be exceptionally good next year. So hopefully things are back to normal and we can really enjoy that because they they're they got some serious talent and uh, yeah he just I think the thing that's always fascinated me the most about him is 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 the the work ethic. I mean, I I don't I've never met him. I don't know you know I don't know him at all. And you can just you can just tell like he's he he's so hungry, um, in that you know his failure will never be because of a lack of effort, and I I really admire that, and it, it is a perfect fit for West Texas because, I mean that's 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 who we are. I mean that's that's how we how we continue to survive. So it's pretty pretty great great insight. This shutdown is difficult for him because he wants to outwork everybody, and right now his hands are tied. I mean he can't be out all the the, the recruiting that he would be. I mean, our players would be getting so much better in this four or five week window. Um, but, you know, and there's some things that would have really been applicable to me as a businessman after being around Chris. He's very, everybody in that program knows exactly what their job is. There is not a GA and there's a bunch of GAs in the program. There's not a GA, there's not a member of that staff that doesn't know exactly what they're supposed to do every day. Uh, and every minute you go to practice, there may be 45 people at practice counting the players and nobody is standing around. Everybody knows what their role is, whether I'm responsible for, for rebounding for players or having the clipboard or having the TV ready or all those sorts of things. It is, it is a machine. And so that's part of it. He's also brutally honest with everybody, not just players, uh, but coaches, uh, staff members, uh, GAs, everybody around that program. He is brutally honest with them. And so they know if he tells them you did this well or you can get better here or whatever, that he is being exactly – he does not play mind games with those kids. He doesn't play mind games with his staff. Uh, everybody knows exactly where they are. So when he says this is what you've got to do to win, those kids believe that. Uh, and and, and it, it's, uh, it's, it's a really – great way to run a business uh, but it's difficult as you know it's difficult when you do evaluations of uh, employees uh, or when you're hiring a person or you're selling to a customer about being brutally honest about what it's going to be like uh, if they become a customer of yours or they're currently there they're they're wanting to understand why they didn't get a promotion or whatever uh, it's difficult to be really honest with everybody all the time but uh, it really is but it makes a huge and profound impact on your organization if i if i reflect back you know two or three years ago when we were you know um well it's a long story but we were hiring too many people too fast and i i think that you know where we were at in that season was we just kind of wanted everyone to be happy we wanted to be able to serve our clients we wanted our clients to be happy 
And so, you know, it kind of stems from, a, you know, what you think is a genuine place, but it has so many unintended negative consequences when you're not really clear and, and people don't know what's expected of them, both positively and negatively. There's a, there's a lady named Brene Brown and she has this uh, phrase, uh, called, you know, she always says it's clear is kind, clear is kind. And, and that, you know, when you talk about the, you know, coach Beard and his athletes and, and, you know, he doesn't play mind games and they always know where they're at. Like that's actually demonstrating kindness to them <laughs> that there's no guessing game. There's no, there's no thinking, you know, you're in a good position, but you're not or vice versa. And so it's really encouraging to hear you say that. And I don't know why, but it's just not natural as humans to, to, to be really transparent and honest. And it seems like that really gets him a lot of results in terms of how athletes trust him and how parents trust him and how coaches trust him and, and all the people like you were mentioning, like GAs and others that are connected to the program. I, I love following, jo I think his name's John Riley. Is that the, is that the strength coach? I love following him on Twitter. I mean, he's, you know, he's bought in, man. <laughs> he is. And everybody that's in that program uh, is going to be bought in or they're not going to be there. I mean, that's, you know, that's just, that's the way it is. You don't end up with players at the end of the game that are disappointed because they didn't get playing time or whatever. They all know where they are and they know exactly what they've got to do to earn playing time. Uh, they also know that something could happen in that game, whether it's an injury or foul trouble or, or, or whatever, and they may be called on and they better be ready. And uh, he talks a lot about uh, body language on the bench and, and how they react to what's happening on the floor and, and, uh, he, I mean, there's just no part of that game that he, that goes uh, untended to inside of uh, Beard's program. This so, is turning into multiple podcasts, so thanks for all your time. But, you know, uh, w one question I have for you, and then I'll ask you my last question and we can wrap up. Again, I really appreciate your time. But one thing that that seems to be true uh, from an outside perspective is, and I, I'm like really big on this because my granddad and my mom were big on it, and that is details. Like, you know, I mean, just details, details, details. And he seems to have everything in place. Like no detail goes unnoticed. This became really obvious to me even recently when John Riley, uh, I think it was yesterday, put on Twitter this photo of the locker room after the national championship game. And it was impeccable. It looked like a cleaning crew. It came, came through there, you know, five minutes after the team left. And it just, it occurred to me, it's like, no, no, they, they take every single detail serious, you know, win or losing. And I wonder, uh, because you have so, so much knowledge of, you know, the whole program, is, is that true? I mean, is that, is that, is that a big deal to them in terms of detail and small things? And what's that look like from your perspective? Uh, it's, you know, it's unbelievable. And, and, you know, I've been there, I've been, I've been in Kansas when we won, I've been in Kansas when we've lost, uh, at Allen Fieldhouse. And uh, the way they do things is, is, again, it's a process and nothing goes, uh, nothing happens by chance. It is, this is, and there's probably two GAs that are responsible for making sure that that locker room looks like when we leave, but the players do their part. Uh, I mean, they have a saying, no entitlement. And uh, I guarantee you, if, if there's ever a player that gets up and leaves a plate on their table, whether it's breakfast in the morning or pregame meal or on the road or whatever, that player only does it once because they will be uh, ridiculed, you know, unmercifully uh, as a set out as an example. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are a million details and, and, and coaches a little bit like uh, I am. He, while he, and he cares about details. Uh, if you go look at his war room, it is not the most organized place in the, in the world. <laughs> And, um, but he, but, but it matters to him. And so he puts people around him that make sure all that stuff gets done. Uh, and like I said, uh, nobody, at, you know, when we leave a locker room, nobody's wondering who's supposed to do what everybody knows exactly what their role is. And, uh, they know who's responsible for making sure this looks just like it was supposed to, uh, when we leave. Yeah, it's awesome. If I could just pause pause everything I have going on in my life for one year and work for free for someone for 12 months, it would be Chris Beard. For, for really the reason you said about how much you can learn about leadership and, and leading a company. Like I think everything you're sharing and everything you know I've observed from just watching him run the program from the outside, it's 100% applicable to your own personal life to business, to any kind of organization. Coach Beard is probably a lot like Dr. Mitchell. You know, you could probably pluck him out of, you know, the basketball program and, 
you know, let him be in charge of primitive <laughs> and he probably do a lot better job than me. So, well, you know, the difference is that, that Chris loves that. And so the idea of spending 18 hours a day, uh, worrying about basketball, I mean, he don't, he don't watch TV. He doesn't, he does read books, but he only reads books that are going to help him be a better basketball coach. Uh, I mean, he, he loves basketball. He loves competition. Uh, he loves the fact that there is a winner and a loser. Uh, and, and he, and, and so I think to him, uh, you know, doing something in the business world that he's financially successful, unless he could see the real competition and know that there's a winner and a loser, uh, that would be difficult. Now I do, I do think you could take him and put him as the, the volleyball coach at, uh, at, you know, Tarleton. And he would be successful there uh, because he's great at motivation. Uh, basketball, he does understand the X's. I mean, he's a great X's and O's coach. It's, it's unusual that you have a coach that's really good at X's and O's, uh, that is really good as a motivator, yep. and really good as a recruiter. Yeah. Uh, because those are three skill sets that don't always go together. Yeah. I think he's the Nick Saban of college basketball. I mean, I, again, I'm, I mean, who am I? I mean, what do I know? But I think he's the Nick Saban of college basketball. And last year after the, the championship game, I was terrified he was going to leave and, and, and ultimately decided just on my own that I didn't think he would because he's like perfect for this situation. And he would surely, he would much rather build his own kingdom and his own dynasty than go kind of walk in the footsteps of someone else's. And I, I think he's going to do it. I, I, he's just so obsessed I think with winning and doing it right that, you know, good things follow. And that's been obvious, you know, in, in a very short period of time. So we're really, really lucky to have him around these parts. And it's uh, been really fun, you know, as an outsider just to watch and to learn. Um, yeah. So thanks for all the insight there. It's, it's, it's really, um, that's really unique and not a lot of people, you know, get the kind of inside insight that you have. And so thanks for sharing all that. My last question for you, if you could speak to your younger self, so think when you're, you know, 20s, young 30s, if you could speak to your younger self, what advice would you give yourself based on what you know now? Um, you know, I would probably tell myself to look up. Um, you know, I think so many of those, uh, so many of my years, I spent worrying about the problems that I had on my desk right then. Uh, things that, that, that were, that were not a problem two months later, two quarters later, two years later, uh, that I was, you get to be so focused on what happens right in, in, on your plate right now that you lose picture or lose perspective on where you're headed, uh, where your business is headed, where your personal life's headed, where your family's headed. Uh, and that you end up being consumed with minor details. And I know there, what's the saying that don't sweat the details. Uh, to some extent, that's, you know, that's really what I would say is that have a perspective that you've got 40 years of a professional life. And what are you going to have at the, end of the, uh, at the end of that period of time to, to look back on? And uh, so you have to be will you have to be able to blend I can't I, I, it's, a, it's a blend you can't right. focus on the long term uh, and say well I, you know I'm only worried about what happens five years from now because what happens between now and five years to, determines where you are in five years and so you have to deal with the, the immediate day-to-day -day stuff but prioritize and blend with that uh, the, the long-term vision of what we're really trying to do here. You know, what kind of brand are we trying to build? What kind of company are we trying to build? What are the market conditions that are changing around us from a, from a business perspective? And from a personal perspective, you know, am I being the best dad that I can be or the best husband that I can be? Am I giving to my church what the, the, the time that I really want to do there? Uh, and make sure that you have all of your priorities in place because it's a it's a balancing act for so many of us, uh, and you can be be very consumed from on the little stuff that's on your desk right now that you don't have time to think about the bigger picture. And so, you know, I, I sort of use the term "look up," and that really means 
Don't just look down at all the stuff that we have right in front of us, but look up and say, where are we headed? What's going to happen? You know, what's, what's the longer term play here? Uh, what, where do, where do I want this segment of my life to be a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? And what do I need to do? What kind of course corrections can I do now to get me headed in that, in that, uh, in that direction? Yeah, absolutely. It's really good. This is this has been really fun. Thank you uh, for joining us. It's lots of really great great insight, and um, yeah, I think this is something I'll re-listen to and learn from. So thanks for sharing your wisdom and for taking time to join us. Well, I appreciate you saying that, Kate. It was uh, fun for me, and be happy to join you again anytime. Thanks, Dusty. Thanks, Kate. Appreciate it.